as uh, it's pretty smart that they put my paper right after the previous paper, because I'm also going to be talking about linear models in the private setting. A quick review on differential privacy. I know we just got this, but in differential privacy, if you have a database and you run an algorithm and you get an output, and then you add or subtract any individual data point from that database, the output of the algorithm when you add or subtract that individual data point shouldn't change very much. The outputs should be roughly indistinguishable. And that's how we protect the privacy of each individual in the database. Because if just looking at the output, I can't determine whether or not somebody was in that input database, then I've protected the privacy of all the individuals in that input database. I've given the definition of differential privacy here, but a few important notes for this presentation. The first is that differentially private algorithms can be composed either sequentially or in parallel. When you compose an algorithm sequentially, meaning you run the algorithm again and again on the same database, you add your privacy parameters, epsilon and delta, whereas when you compose them in parallel, you split up the data set into different disjoint chunks and you run an algorithm on each disjoint chunk, then the privacy parameters remain the same, even when you combine all of the different outputs from the algorithm run on those disjoint chunks. Next, there's an important parallel between algorithmic stability and differential privacy. Machine learning theorists, uh, you know, back in the day, algorithmic stability, they defined it as the output of an algorithm should not change very much when one data point in, that data, in the data set changes. Right? And that's essentially what differential privacy is saying. The only difference is that machine learning theorists would allow themselves to make assumptions about the distribution of data because it's theory, right? Whereas differential privacy wants to protect privacy in the worst case. So you make no assumptions about the data distribution. And then finally, we only tested global differentially private algorithms in this work. There's another setting called local differential privacy where each individual retains their own data. And if there's a scientist trying to query uh, or create a model from different disjoint chunk, uh, sorry, different data, which is contained by individuals, then they could noise their data as they're sending it back to some server. But that produces typically a very low signal to noise ratio. So it's hard to get anything useful out of that. And so for that reason, we tested global differentially private algorithms in this work. The only other piece of background information you need to know is high dimensional regression. When you're operating in high dimensions, you have more features than the number of data points. And therefore, you have infinite possible solutions to a regression problem. How do we choose which solution of those infinite possible solutions is the best? The way statisticians have typically done it is by looking for a sparse solution, right? So a simpler solution is preferred over a more complicated solution. And we encode some sort of prior information by saying, well, simpler means sparse. And so ideally, we'd solve this problem. We'd like to find a k-sparse parameter vector, which minimizes the empirical risk. But optimizing over this can be difficult because the constraint set is non-convex. So we typically relax this in two ways. One way is you simply minimize over the L1 constraint set. So instead of having a k-sparse parameter vector, you have a vector which has bounded L1 norm. And then otherwise, you can also do regularized uh, empirical risk minimization, where you've got two conflicting terms, one in which you want to find a model which minimizes the empirical risk, and another which wants to have the parameter vector have simple structure. I want to mention that both of these solutions also tend to produce sparse solutions, but they might not be the same sparse solution that you would find if you could solve the ideal problem. And so the objective in this work was to review and systematically compare the performance of differentially private linear and logistic re regression algorithms for high dimensional data. 
the first part of this study was reviewing all of the different algorithms. I'm going to go through different categories of algorithms, not the individual algorithms themselves, because that would take a long time. You can read our paper where we actually do talk about each individual algorithm, but here I've grouped them into classes. The first is model selection. In model selection papers, you typically split up your high dimensional regression problem into two steps. The first step is you identify the support set of your parameter vector. And then the second step is now that you've identified the support set, using just those features, you optimize and find a parameter vector, which is k-sparse. The next methods use the Frank-Wolf algorithm, which is a pretty old optimization algorithm developed, I believe, in 1956. The Frank-Wolf algorithm iteratively chooses to move towards a vertex of a polytope constraint in a private manner. That is a lot of words, but it's actually very simple. Wherever you are in your law space, take a first order Taylor approximation, and then just move towards the vertex of like your constrained L1 ball uh, a little bit. And you do this iteratively and you will achieve a good solution. Next are ADMM methods. ADMM stands for Alternating Direction Method of Multipliers. This is a fairly recent optimization framework. And the reason this is notable is because when you're trying to find a sparse solution, there have been works which have shown that sparsity is an inherently algorithmically unstable. But the ADMM algorithm splits up the sparsity-inducing step from the privacy-inducing step. And in doing that, the authors of the ADMM algorithm argue that because they're not adding noise in the step which retains sparsity, they should produce better solutions. We have compressed learning methods. This is very simple. You have a design matrix, your input data set, you multiply it by a random projection matrix. Now you're in low dimensions and you simply run an algorithm, a differentially private algorithm to optimize in that lower dimensional setting. What I will say though, is a lot of times people are trying to do high dimensional regression and identify the parameter vector in the original space. And the reason for that is you get some interpretability benefits from seeing that sparse vector and identifying which components are non-zero in the original space. And so the, the authors of this method, the, the final step in this method is to find a K sparse parameter vector which corresponds to the vector that you optimized privately in the low dimensional setting. The reason I'm bringing this up is because when we ran actual simulations of all of these different methods, that step, despite it being convex, timed out a lot. And so there's a reason why this method doesn't show up in some of our tables in the paper. Next are thresholding methods. This is super simple. Every time you take a gradient step, you just keep your top K absolute uh, top, top K coefficients in absolute value. That's all you have to do. Next are coordinate descent methods, just like gradient descent methods. You take steps in the direction of the maximal coordinate change, right? So these methods are using greedy coordinate descent and you only optimize over a single coordinate at a time. And finally, we have mirror descent. This is also a fairly new optimization framework in which you can use iteratively stronger regularization to solve a constrained optimization problem. Before I move on from this slide, there are two sorts of methods that I really want to highlight. The first are heavy tailed methods. So here you can see that some of these methods start with HT. These are heavy tailed methods. Unlike all of the other optimization methods highlighted on this slide, these methods don't require you to bound the norm of your input data set. They use robust gradient estimation to ensure that the gradient that they're updating with is clipped, right, in some setting, in some sense. And so therefore they don't require you to compress your data to, work to some sort of norm restricted space. And another uh, important, Class of methods are all the coordinate descent methods in which you don't need to compress the entire data sets norm, you just need to compress the norm of your features. And this is gonna be important in a few slides. This was our experiment setup 
quite simple. 18 different algorithms. We pass them through three linear regression and three logistic regression data sets. We do a hyperparameter search and we report the best mean squared error and best accuracies for each method. I'm not gonna put down all the results for all the different data sets that would take forever and be very small on the screen. And I know that this is still very small on the screen, but what I really wanna highlight here is that most methods and this was true across data sets and across different epsilon values, perform quite similarly. The methods which perform a lot better are either the coordinate descent or the heavy tailed methods. And the reason for this is because they don't have those restrictions on the norm of a data set. So let's think about why. Say you've got a data set. The data sets we tested in this uh, study were not simulated data sets. They were data sets we just collected from online. Data sets tend to have outliers. Now, all of a sudden, I need to compress the norm of my data set, which means I scale all my data points down to some restricted norm space. I do this because in differentially private optimization algorithms, it's very classic to have to have bounded Lipschitz constant. And this is the way you enforce that. All of a sudden, most of my data points are now near the zero vector because I've divided by the norm of some very large outlier, which means that I've destroyed the signal to noise ratio in my data set. And now I'm optimizing, I'm adding noise proportional to the norm of the data set, which is now restricted, but most of my data points are near the zero vector. And so this is one of the main takeaways from this study, is that bounding the norm of data points to guarantee a Lipschitz constant in order to do optimization can produce a low signal to noise ratio. And greedy coordinates descent and heavy tailed methods work well since they require either fewer or no assumptions on the norm of data sets. And this is something that's important and something that I've been thinking about personally uh, more and more recently, that differentially private algorithms really require us to be smart about the way we take our data and put it into an algorithm. Next, implemented in Python, some of these algorithms are incredibly slow. That might be a function of me writing my code. All my code is released online. You can go and look at it. But uh, the reason I mention this is because this entire project was done for a client who actually needed to implement these algorithms in a real world setting. And we actually had to improve the speed of the differentially private Frank Wolf algorithm. You can see a paper that we published in NeurIPS last year about how to do that. So you have to do some smart data structures manipulations in order to get these to actually work on real world high dimensional data sets. Next, reg increasing regularization constants don't necessarily correspond to increasing sparsity. The reason this is notable is because it goes against the way that we think about things in the non-private setting. Increasing the lambda value tends to mean that you're gonna have smaller, you're gonna have fewer and fewer non-zero components. But because we're doing private optimization, that doesn't necessarily hold. So it's just important to note that. And then finally, just like everything in differential privacy, choosing an epsilon value can be challenging. If you go back to the previous slide, you can see that our performance barely changed from epsilon equal to one to epsilon equal to five. And since linear modding, modeling is typically part of a larger pipeline, we want to find the smallest epsilon value at which we achieve that sort of maximal performance that we're gonna get, and it's not going to increase past that. So that then we can save our privacy budget for the next steps. That's all I've got, thank you. <laughs>